fourth session entitled The Role of Law Associations in Promoting the Rule of Law. Tonight we will explore the proposition that bar associations and law societies have a critical societal duty in upholding the rule of law. This duty is sometimes called the rule of law mandate. It would require taking positions without fear or favour to promote the rule of law regardless of its own interest. This webinar will explore the challenges faced by bar associations and law societies in discharging this duty and how these challenges may be confronted and overcome. We are fortunate to have eminent speakers joining our panel this evening. Dr. Jacoba Brash, QC, President of the Law Council of Australia, David Green, President of the Law Society of England and Wales, Paul Harris, SC, Chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association, Linda Kazonde, Vice President of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association for Africa, and Prashant Kumar, President of the Bar Association of India. We are privileged to have you join us as panelists this evening, and thank you. I would also like to acknowledge the work done and commitment made to this conference by the following organizations, Law Asia, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, the Law Council of Australia, the South Pacific Lawyers Association. And obviously I would like to thank those in the background who are, have put so much work into making the IT and everything a comfortable process for everyone today. Now these organizations without which uh, the commitment that has been proffered, uh, this event could not proceed. So I wish to thank them. I note that we have over 330 delegates from 42 countries. I cannot name all jurisdictions as it would take up far too much time this evening. But to say that the alphabet is truly covered. To all of you joining us from different corners of the globe and at different times, a special welcome. The program is this, this evening is that we will have each speaker present in turn, and I'll introduce each speaker immediately before their presentation. The session will conclude at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time. I would be grateful if you could post your questions in the Q&A function and note to whom you would like the question to be directed if you can. And thank you to those who've already sent in your questions prior to this session. Some of those will be hopefully um, asked and we have sufficient time to cover all. Immediately after the presentations, there will be um, a panel discussion and then the Q&A session as I've just um, referred to. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Jacoba Brash, QC, who is president of the Law Council of Australia. Dr. Jacoba Brash, QC, became president of the Law Council of Australia in 2021. She joined the Law Council as a director from the Bar Association of Queensland in September 2017. In 2018, Dr. Brash was elected by directors to the executive and then to the position of treasurer in 2019. Until her election as president-elect in late 2019, Dr. Brash was also the inaugural chair of the Law Council's Domestic and Family Violence Task Force. A member of the Family Law Section Executive and inaugural chair of the Australian Bar Association's Access to Justice Committee and inaugural chair of its Family Law Committee. And a break from her more usual areas of practice, Dr. Brush is the chair of the Queensland Rugby League Asada Anti Doping Tribunal. Admitted to the bar in 2000, Dr. Brush's practice centres on family law, child protection, mental health law, and family violence. She has appeared in various states and territories of Australia and often appears in the full court of the Family Court of Australia. She has also appeared in the High Court of Australia with matters including but not limited to customs and excise, family law and the Hague Convention, uh, particularly relating to child abduction. Prior to coming to the bar, Dr. Brush completed her LLM at New York University as a Fulbright Scholar and NYU Graduate Merit Scholar and Preparatory Studies at UCLA, Davis and Berkeley. In 2010, Dr. Brush graduated with a PhD from the University of New South Wales with her doctoral thesis concerned with con uh, what constitutes a fair, independent and impartial trial. She was a delegate to Bangladesh and Vanuatu as part of the Australian Associate Bar Association's advocacy delegations in 2012 and 2013. 
and was the Law Council's representative at the Roundtable of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse in 2014. Thank you, Jacoba. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm delighted to join today's webinar program alongside my distinguished colleagues, President Green, Chairman Harris, Vice President Cassandre. I also acknowledge the terrific collaboration that Mary's already identified, Law Asia, Commonwealth Lawyers Association, South Pacific Lawyers Association and the Law Council. This webinar series has achieved unprecedented um, geographic reach in the Asia Pacific re region and indeed across Africa, the Middle East, Europe and the Caribbean and the Americas. So greetings to all from sunny Australia. Only four weeks ago, when I made some brief remarks for the opening ceremony of this series, I mentioned how over the past 12 months, the principles we collectively refer to as the rule of law have been cha challenged in jurisdictions large and small. They continue to be so. In Australia, the imperative to respond decisively to the COVID-19 pandemic has led to the use of extraordinary powers, increased use of ministerial discretion and delegated legislation and expedited legislative processes. Like many of our counterparts in jurisdictions around the world, the Law Council and Australia's state and territory law associations, law societies and bar associations have been duty bound by virtue of our legal expertise and sense of responsibility to the communities we serve to monitor and where appropriate, call out excessive, unnecessary and disproportionate exercises of government power. No doubt Chairman Harris SC will provide an update on the developments in Hong Kong since the passage of the national security law and its implications for the rule of law in Hong Kong. This is an issue which the Law Council has followed extremely closely and with great concern. I listened with great interest to the remarks of his immediate past chair, Philip Dykes SC, at the opening of the Hong Kong law year and related conferences thereafter. We remain, the Law Council remains gravely concerned for what was Myanmar's fragile democracy following the coup d'etat on the 1st of February. In recent weeks, we've publicly expressed our great concern regarding the arbitrary detention of elected leaders of Myanmar's civil government, lawyers, journalists, medical professionals, and protesters, and the utterly unacceptable use of live ammunition against peaceful protesters. In the United States, we watched as a now former president sought to coerce and inveigle all three branches of government to, to effectively unseparate the separation of powers to discredit and overturn or to try to discredit and overturn the results of free and fair elections as found by the courts where challenges were brought. It was the rule of law and particularly an independent judiciary, which was the tether preserving the integrity of the electoral process and America's democracy. As independent law societies and bar associations, we build trust in the rule of law in a number of ways. First, we promote the development of good law, which is consistent with rule of law principles, constitutional requirements and human rights obligations. And we are vocal when the laws fall short. For example, only this week, I appeared before a government committee to express our great concerns regarding some new surveillance powers and their potential implications. Second, we watch over the practical implementation of law, policy, pub and publicly comment on its workability and guard against discrimination and unfairness. Mary in her introduction hit the nail on the head. We act without fear and we act without favor. And last, but certainly not least, we closely watch the exercise of government power and openly advocate for transparency and accountability. Put frankly, it is our obligation as independent law societies and bar associations at times to speak truth to power. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do or a pleasant thing to do, but such is the duty we have as custodians of the rule of law. In Australia, we have a number of channels through which we advocate and make our concerns known. In this way, the Law Council works towards developing effective 
practical and just laws. We also have broad latitude to freely engage in lively public debate. I recognise, though, from the outset that in many jurisdictions, law societies and bar associations operate with more limited constraints than we do in Australia and at far greater personal risk. I acknowledge the courage and conviction of those leaders. While there's no guidebook on how to respond to threats to the rule of law in our jurisdictions, our law and bar associations nonetheless have a range of strategies which can be used. For example, where appropriate, identify, seek and identify common ground with government without shying away from where we differ. Persuasion, after all, we're advocates. Persuasion, persuading governments to consider or reconsider laws and policies which better accord with the rule of law and constitutional and human rights obligations. Where high level reforms are politically fraught, law and bar associations can suggest initiatives which tangibly improve the state of access to justice and the ability of persons to protect and defend their rights. And of course, joined by our common respect for the rule of law, our international counterparts, that is, many of us here, our peak law associations, are helpful sounding boards, advisors and supporters. Indeed, I very much enjoyed the opening of the law year in President's Roundtables in, in inverted commas, in Singapore and Hong Kong, where many of us spoke about the challenges of COVID to legal practice and legal service delivery. They were thought provoking sessions, just as these sessions have been too. Um, they're all sessions where many of us have following up with one on one meetings for further discussions. There are two specific areas critical to the rule of law, which should always guide the advocacy of law and bar associations. One, a strong and independent judiciary. Former Chief Justice of Australia's High Court, the Honourable Sir Gerard Brennan said, judicial independence does not exist to serve the judiciary, nor the other two branches of government. It exists to serve and protect not the governors, but the governed. Public confidence, he said, is the power base of the judiciary. We have long advocated for a federal judicial commission um, as an independent, procedurally fair and transparent means of dealing with complaints against the judiciary. We have some hope from recent announcements that our long held um, advocacy may be bearing some fruits. The second is to advocate for a fair and effective justice system that meets the needs of the community it serves and protects the rights of our most vulnerable and disenfranchised. For example, it's all very good and well for lawyers to use electronic platforms to engage with clients and the courts, especially when COVID-19 makes it impossible to meet face to face. But we can't forget that not everyone has access to a computer or the bandwidth or indeed the IT literacy or, for example, in family violence situations, the privacy to use this technology. As users of the justice system, we of course also play an important role in identifying service gaps, delays and other efficiencies. We are regularly and consistency, consistently advocating for proper resourcing of federal courts and tribunals. In our region, the Law Council is committed to supporting law societies and bar associations in the South Pacific. In 2011, the Law Council, with the support of the IBA, the International Bar Association, established the South Pacific Lawyers Association. The idea behind this was to bring together the voices, individual voices of small law societies in countries beset by rule of law issues so they could build a strong voice for the legal profession in the Pacific. The Law Council has had the privilege of serving as its secretariat since that time. Critically, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, excuse me. In the past year, what we have seen is the fragility of the democratic and justice institutions, which are the bedrock of our just and free societies. It's also demonstrated the strength of our shared commitment as law societies bar associations and the lawyers we represent to promoting and upholding the rule of law, both within our jurisdictions and across our borders. 
May we as bar leaders and the law societies and bar associations we represent tread the balance between partner and watchdog with courage, integrity, respect and good judgment and fulfil our duty to protect the rights of the communities we serve. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Jacoba. We now move to our second speaker. We are fortunate indeed to have Mr. David Green join us this evening. David is the president of the Law Society of England and Wales. David specializes in commercial litigation, including competition claims and claims on behalf of shareholders and is head of the Group Action Litigation Department. He was articled with Edwin Coe and qualified in 1980, becoming a partner in 1984 and senior partner in April 2011. David is currently serving as the 176th President of the Law Society, the independent professional body for solicitors in England and Wales. In this role, he represents the organisation at home and abroad and is chair of their council. David won the Law Society's presidential election for 2018 and was appointed as Deputy Vice President in July 2018, becoming Vice President in 2019 and President in 2020-21. He has developed a strong following in contentious competition work, being involved in cases in front of the Competition Appeal Tribunal, high, the High Court and Competition Commission. He has for many years advised sovereign states on disputes in international tribunals and particularly specialises in work involving governments in sub-Sahara Africa. David was appointed by the Lord Chancellor to the Civil Procedure Rules Committee in 1997. He was then appointed in 2002 as a member of the Civil Justice Council. He is an author of Civil Procedure Rules, an associate editor of the Civil Practice Manual and an editorial board of Butterworth's the Civil Court Practice, which is known as the Green Book, as I understand it, and a contributor to the Law Society Civil Litigation Manual and the author of two titles for Atkins Court Forms. I will now hand it over to David. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good morning from uh, London. Uh, where it's uh, pretty early in the morning. What are we to tell you? 5.47 in the morning. Uh, and uh, I just noticed Mary uh, drinking a cup of tea that she's having her afternoon tea and uh, I'm having my morning tea uh, here uh, in um, London. Uh, and thank you very much um, for inviting me uh, to speak today. I've actually been attending. I've been getting up fairly early um, the last few weeks to attend um, these sessions. Uh, and uh, in particular, the I've uh, attended last week's and, and once previously. Uh, I, I am, as you say, um, the president of the Law Society of England and Wales, and uh, I am actually a council member of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. So that's that's uh, I have a particular interest uh, in um, this series, uh, and uh, it's really great to see a collaboration between Law Asia the CLA, Commonwealth Lawyers Association, Law Council of Australia, and South Pacific um, Lawyers Association. Um, in terms of um, the region, about um, 5,000 of, of um, solicitors from England and Wales uh, work permanently abroad, uh, and doing so in the Asia and Pacific region. And I, and I value really um, our opportunity to work with um, our brother and sister bars um, uh, here. Um, in 2020, um, the Rule of Law Index recorded worldwide deterioration and stagnation in its eight categories. Um, we seem to be going backwards. Uh, and it's part of a consistent trend uh, which um, makes up a worrying decline uh, in the uh, global rule of law. And that was happening prior to the pandemic. Uh, but the pandemic has made um, the social and economic inequalities which correlate with the undermining of the rule of law uh, even more stark. In February of last year, when for many the pandemic had not yet touched our lives, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, gave his remarks to the Human Rights, Human, UN Human Rights Council. He said that human rights today face growing challenges. 
He said the rule of law is being eroded. And when we're beset with so many examples around the world, it is hard to dispute that what he said is absolutely correct. And it's our job uh, to stand up for it. Uh, I often say is that, that uh, if we lawyers don't stand up for um, the rule of law, whether that be individually uh, or indeed um, uh, collectively in, in our law associations or bars, uh, then who is going to do it? Uh, and I particularly think of um, the work we do in relation to uh, endangered lawyers. Uh, whether the crises we face are conflict, natural disaster or illness, we know that the rights of people can fall by the wayside if we are not vigilant. This is a very real emergency uh, and it brings with it a risk to the rule of law. As decisions are made quickly and without the normal level of scrutiny, by the governments world over. Sometimes this erosion is deliberate, but too often it is the result of short-sightedness when attempting to counter the circumstances we find ourselves in to find simple solutions to complex problems. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen here, and I think that is seen um, around the world, uh, and I was discussing the other day, uh, it is um, the growth of soft law um, so that um, we, we know the hard law, we know the traditions of the hard law, but what we have seen, and I fear it's an increasing trend, is uh, the growth of soft law, guidance notes, um, directives, um, other, other um, seemingly law type um, directives uh, that um, are, are being uh, enforced uh, without actually passing through the statutory process. But in all of this, luckily, lawyers can and have shown themselves to be of use. Uh, I know that members of our profession will always do their utmost to ensure that drastic measures adopted to combat an unprecedented crisis do not go one step further, last one moment longer than they must. Uh, and certainly we're just entering that, that debate about the uh, adherence, about the, um, whether those laws will last um, uh, and how long they will last. Adherence to the rule of law requires that restrictions be clearly defined in national law without ambiguity or misinterpretation by officials, preventing the arbitrary or excessive use of power. When the pandemic is over, reversing these worrisome trends and finding paths for just and equitable responses is imperative and a necessary condition for a sustainable recovery. We must ensure that any emergency decrees issued during this exceptional period do not impact on access to justice and to legal advice, and that executives are not given carte blanche by legislators. The relationship between lawyers and the rule of law is as some symbiotic as you might expect a strong rule of law is fundamental to the protection of an independent legal profession and therefore an essential guarantee of all rights. The legal profession is vital to ensure that checks and balances are in place to prevent the use of arbitrary or excessive exercise of power by ensuring that no one is above the law. Without independence, lawyers are left vulnerable to arbitrary actions that prevent them from exercising their professional duties as lawyers. Lawyers globally have been targeted simply for acting in the public interest or for acting in controversial, controversial cases or representing certain clients. Contrary to what is stipulated in the UN basic principles on the role of lawyers, lawyers are often identified with their clients or their clients' causes. And we're all susceptible to this. Um, however developed our democracy, uh, lawyers can be targets uh, and we've seen some recent um, language used in relation to lawyers, particularly doing immigration work here, uh, which makes them potentially into targets. Uh, and, and we have concerns about uh, our home jurisdiction as much as uh, anyone does. Uh, the work Law Asia has done to bolster the rule of law and the independence of the profession is invaluable. Uh, and indeed, as I say, is uh, I, I'm a member of the Council of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, and it too has been doing um, uh, sterling work. 
Well, Asia is a signatory to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. It holds an imports and human rights forum and is a respected member of the previously mentioned Global Compact and Forum for SG16, which we've recently um, joined. Many great speakers and thinkers have spoken of how the arc of the moral universe bend towards justice. But if it does, it does so only because so many are committed to make it so. In a thousand ways, in a thousand places, they labor. So the net of justice, human rights, and the rule of law is cast wider. Even as judicial independence is encroached upon, internal organizations made up of those committed to their principles come together in support of them. Even as lawyers and human rights defenders face intimidation and reprisals simply up for upholding the rights of their clients, others, like our law association societies, rally in support. Even as the rule of law is threatened, people stand to preserve it. Such a pursuit is constant and needs to be constant. It's not work that we will ever complete. But it is beyond necessary, and I thank everyone here for their commitment to it. And, and I end there, uh, I'm very happy to discuss uh, the work that we've been doing uh, as a law association, as a law society, uh, in relation to uh, upholding the rule of law and human rights. Thank you, David. I'll take you up on that during the uh, Q&A okay. session to ask you, I think, about uh, what is occurring at the Law Society of England and Wales. We now move on to our third speaker. It is wonderful to have Mr. Paul Harris SC join us this evening to update us about developments in Hong Kong. Paul Harris SC is a public law and human rights specialist who also has considerable experience of other areas of civil litigation. He practices in Hong Kong, where he is one of the territory's leading public law silks, and in London, where he is a member of Dowdy Street Chambers. Paul has been elected as chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association for the year 2021. Paul is well known for a series of successful human rights cases against the Hong Kong government, but has wide experience of other areas of Hong Kong law, including land, commercial disputes, employment, personal injuries, injunctions, including Mariva and Anton Pillar orders and contested probate actions. He has handled a number of cases involving difficult issues of conflict of laws as well. In his English practice, Paul does a wide range of immigration, housing and other public law cases and recent immigration cases, including asylum claims from Belarus and China and a family reunion case from Nigeria and a complex case involving an entrepreneur from Malaysia and many others of this character. Might I hand it over to you, Paul? Yes, thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. Um, what I thought I would do in the short time available is um, focus on two different areas where I think I ha have something to contribute. Um, uh, Jacopa talked about um, uh, the international dimension to um, uh, standing up for the rule of law. And I think uh, there is a sort of distinction to be drawn between um, standing up for the rule of law in one's own jurisdiction where one practices and uh, intervening to help uh, in other countries. And um, long years ago, I was the first chairman of the English Bar's Human Rights Committee. And that committee was set up uh, initially with a rather undefined remit, um, but uh, how we uh, constructed it was to make it uh, a group that intervened to help judges or lawyers around the world who were being persecuted or harassed for doing an honest job. Um, we took the view that uh, internal English issues were either for the whole bar or they were for politicians and they were not for a professional association. Um, but helping overseas uh, was something that we could do. And although the remit I've described to non-lawyers might sound narrow, most lawyers will realize it's actually um, almost infinitely wide, and the problem is actually choosing where you can intervene with your limited resources. And what we tried to do there was to pick places um, which 
um, where we felt outside intervention could make a difference. There are some countries in the world, um, North Korea springs to mind, where outside intervention seems unlikely to be very productive in most cases. And we tried to focus on places where there were serious problems, but where we felt the society was open enough that um, a group of foreign lawyers coming in could achieve something. And um, the place we uh, chose for our first major intervention was Malawi, uh, which was in those days still uh, under the rule of the late Hastings Banda, who combined uh, being a uh, dictator with being someone with a major soft spot for the United Kingdom, where he'd lived for a long period of his life. And uh, we intervened to uh, try to secure the release of two uh, Lincoln's Inn barristers who were Malawians, who had been opposition politicians imprisoned after a, um, a show trial. I'm talking about Orton and Vera Chirwa. Uh, we, we saw Banda, we asked for release, he said no, we asked to see them, he said yes, we got in and saw them, a very uh, moving experience. Orton died shortly afterwards, there was um, an autopsy by a British uh, pathologist, it was natural causes though aggravated by years of lack of care. Vera was released immediately after our um, report uh, public, was published on our visit, so we felt that was effective. And we later um, brought Vera to London to talk about her experiences to members of the English bar, which I think was a very good learning uh, process for all concerned. So I think that um, those of you listening who are in uh, bar associations where you feel the rule of law in your own country is at least reasonably well established and secure, one model that you could adopt for helping in other places is something similar to the English Bar Human Rights Committee, which is now very well established, been going for uh, something approaching 30 years, and which does a lot of interventions of that kind. Now, I move on to threats to the rule of law in your own jurisdiction. Well, what you can do varies a great deal depending where you are, as I've already said, certain issues will turn into party political issues. It seems to me important that law associations do not become party political vehicles. Um, they have a specific role representing the profession and defending the rule of law as um, understood, meaning not only that there are laws, but that every person, no matter how important, is subject to the rule of law. That, that's a clear remit. Uh, and in Hong Kong, that's written into the Bar Association's constitution. Uh, we are all as barristers required to defend the rule of law, judicial independence, human rights, and Hong Kong's basic law, which is Hong Kong's mini constitution, which in so itself uh, includes many provisions, which are guarantees of human rights or different aspects of judicial independence and the rule of law. Now, what one can actually do is quite a complex matter. Certain things one can do on a regular basis so that they're almost uh, uh, routine work. Um, the Hong Kong Bar Association regularly comments on legislation. Uh, it uh, comments both on bills before the Legislative Council and on um, existing laws in need, need of, which may be in need of change or reform. Um, it, ha it has also spoken out traditionally for many years on uh, wider issues about the rule of law. And as some of you will now know, we're in a very sensitive situation at the moment in Hong Kong. Um, and I think it's right that I should just tell you my own experience, having taken over just less than two months ago. One of the um, matters here that's received a great deal of attention internationally as well as domestically is the national security law um, uh, imposed uh, on Hong Kong by uh, the Central People's Government, the Beijing government, in uh, July last year. Um, when I was asked about this after I became the 
chairman, I said, well, most countries have a national security law in one form or another. It may not be called a national security law, but um, there's no objection in principle to having a law of that kind. But there are aspects of this law that seem to me to um, erode the rule of law. And I referred particularly to an article, Article 60, which says that um, the staff of the Office for National Security being set up in Hong Kong under that law shall not be subject to the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, so not subject to, to the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts. I said that that seemed wrong and that I would hope that there would be a possibility of proposing some amendments. This brought down a storm of abuse, vituperation, and um, um, insults on my head um, of a quite extraordinary kind. I was uh, accused of attempting to overthrow Hong Kong's social order. I was accused of manipulating the Bar Association for political purposes. I was accused of not understanding Hong Kong's constitutional structure and so on. It was very extreme. Um, and it was simply in response to a proposal to for some relatively minor but important modifications to this law in the interests of safeguarding the rule of law. Now, where do we go from here? Um, I've asked a committee of the Bar Association to, to look very closely at the law and try and uh, identify these specific provisions a bit more closely, see what arguments can be put for them and against them and see whether perhaps we can come up with some proposals that might be uh, something we could discuss with the Hong Kong government. Um, but whether that will happen, I do not know. This I think is a graphic illustration of where the commitment to the rule of law and defending the rule of law runs up against a political situation that is very difficult. Um, of course, um, I bear in mind, as well as the rule of law, that uh, I have to defend the interests of my members, their ability to practice, um, their uh, general reputation. Um, and uh, this illustrates, I think, some of the constraints and difficulties that one can um, come under in carrying out this duty that I think probably every one of us in our um, uh, law associations or bar associations in different countries is actually officially uh, committed to. So I've outlined the problem there. I'm afraid I don't have uh, any easy solution, but I hope that does at least provide um, a bit of material to think about. So I'll stop at that point. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Perhaps we can explore this a little more in our panel session as well. Now it is great, my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Linda Cassonde, Vice President for Africa of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And she is a, a resident of Zambia. Linda is a lawyer and civil rights activist. Linda obtained an LLB law degree from the University of uh, Lester in England in 2000 and an LLM law degree from the University of Cape Town in 2007. Linda was admitted to the Zambian bar in 2001 and in 2014 she became the first female partner in an established and internationally recognized Zambian law firm and to be elevated to the position of named partner. She is also the first woman to be elected as president of the Law Association of Zambia and the history of the Bar Association in Zambia pre or post Zambia's independence in 1964. She is currently the founder and executive director of Chapter One Foundation, which promotes and protects human rights, human rights defenders, constitutionalism, the rule of law and social justice in Zambia through civic education, advocacy and strategic public litigation. In April 2019, she was also elected as the Vice President for Africa for the Commonwealth Lawyers Association and is the first Zambian to hold that position. I welcome Linda and uh, hand it over to you.
Uh, thank you for that introduction, Mary. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here as a representative of the Commonwealth uh, Lawyers Association uh, and happy to be uh, collaborating with Law Asia, the Law Council of Australia, and the South Pacific Lawyers Association. So, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association promotes and protects the rule of law and human rights across the Commonwealth, um, mainly through um, providing solidarity and, and, and supporting uh, law associations through the Commonwealth. So I'm the current Vice President for Africa, but uh, in my previous life, as mentioned by Mary, I was elected the first female president of the Law Association of Zambia. And my paper is entitled The Independence of the Bar and the Role of the Law, of law Associations in the Democratic Transformation of Africa, the Zambian Example. So as I mentioned, I was elected uh, president of the Law Association in 2016, uh, the first female to, to, be, to be elected. And that year was also the year that we had our last general elections. So it was a politically turbulent time. By way of background, Zambia has in the past been seen as a beacon of peace and stability in Africa. Since multi-party democracy was reintroduced in 1991, Zambia has held generally peaceful elections with smooth transitions of power. We've had two elections in which an incumbent has conceded to an opposition party leader, a rarity on the African continent. That narrative is currently under threat as part of the global decline of democracy and the rule of law. The Law Association of Zambia, or LAS, as its, as its acronym is, is called, is a statutory body that exists not only to regulate the legal profession in Zambia, but also to promote and protect the rule of law, constitutionalism, good governance, and social justice in Zambia. Essential to upholding the rule of law, the association has a mandate to defend and protect the independence of the legal profession as well as the judiciary. Now, performing that role well will inevitably lead to some differences with government as politics, particularly African politics and the rule of law often conflict. The political tensions uh, uh, pre the 2016 uh, general election period uh, led to pockets of violence in the country. Political skirmishes between the ruling party and the main opposition UPND party were growing and there were increased breaches of the rule of law in the country. Parliament was dissolved in May 2016, three months before the general elections on the 11th of August 2016. Constitutionally, all ministers and deputy ministers were obliged to leave office after the dissolution of parliament as their positions were dependent on being members of parliament. When they didn't uh, vacate their offices, Laz sued every minister, deputy minister and provincial minister in their personal capacities for staying in office after the dissolution of parliament, contrary to the constitution. We eventually got a judgment in our favor in August 2016, but this is where the attacks on the Law Association began. They were mainly targeted at me as the president of LAS and were very vicious, aimed at discriminate, dis discrediting me and the association. No one thought that a Zambian court could rule in our favor over such a politically sensitive case. I was once even called legally blonde by a ruling polit uh, patriotic front, CADA. Um, but on the eve of the 2016 general elections, the Constitutional Court ruled in favor of LAS, ordering every minister, deputy minister, and provincial minister to pay back all the emoluments they had received after the dis dissolution of parliament. This was a landmark victory for the association, but this jubilation was short-lived. Regarding judicial independence, our constitution, which is the supreme law by which all the inhabitants of Zambia are bound, sets out the parameters within which the people of Zambia should be ruled and, and provides for separation of powers and checks and balances. The judiciary, as you know, are the guardians of the constitution and the rule of law in Zambia. The judiciary have a duty to the people of Zambia to uphold the law regardless of personalities or the subject matter involved. 
Unfortunately, this has not always been the case. As the Law Association of Zambia remarked in 2012, while we are strong proponents of judicial independence, we are equally stronger proponents of judicial accountability. Judicial independence and judicial accountability are not inconsistent and therefore can coexist. The judiciary should not be elitist or untouchable. Since the 2016 amendments to our constitution, we've seen a rise in what South African Chief Justice Moheng has observed in South Africa, which is known as lawfare, the fighting of political battles through the courts. Often, such cases are determined in favor of the state or the ruling party. The newly created Constitutional Court, which was created in 2016, um, came under the spotlight as it was solely mandated to adjudicate over the presidential petition that, uh, that followed the 2016 general elections. Article 101, subsection five of the constitution requires that the presidential petition must be heard within 14 days of the filing of the petition. During the presidential election petition, controversy arose as the constitutional court reversed its decision to extend the time for hearing the petition over a weekend, leading to the, leading to the suspicion of extrajudicial interference. Also, controversy arose over whether the pres presidential petition had to be heard or determined within 14 days. All in all, the public was dissatisfied with the manner in which the proceedings took place and public confidence in the constitutional court fell. Rather than publicly condemn the judiciary, we, we as the Law Association of Zambia opted for a closed door meeting with the judiciary uh, to discuss the issue. In 2017, a case was brought in the constitutional court to determine whether the incumbent president Edgar Lungu had served two full terms in office as he had taken over the presidency following the demise of his predecessor, Michael Sutter. Under our constitution, a president can only hold office twice. But in November 2017, President Lungu threatened the constitutional court judges not to follow the Kenyan example um, by ruling against him on the question of whether he was eligible to stand in the 2021 presidential elections. Also during November 2017, the presidential press aide, Amos Chanda, gave an interview on the public broadcaster, suggesting that any judgment against the member of parliament from the ruling party was not in the interests of justice. The statements went further to suggest that there would be repercussions against any judge that rules against the ruling party member of parliament. Laz came out very strongly to condemn the attacks on the judiciary. Nonetheless, when the judgment came out in 2018, it was in favor of the president. On independence of the legal profession, Laz continued to speak out strongly against various breaches of the rule of law, political violence, and attacks against the judiciary. This in turn led to intensified attacks on me personally and, the, and Laz generally, in the mainstream media that support the government and on social media. In December 2016, a group of patriotic front, ruling Patriotic Front cadres demonstrated in the city center with professionally printed banners denouncing me and calling on me to step down. Uh, this was following a strong statement by Laz condemning attacks on the independence of the judiciary by the presidential spokesperson. The secretary general of the ruling party declared me a political enemy and soon after, three ruling party MPs held a press conference saying that if Laz did not change, they would take steps to dissolve the association. In March 2017, following a decision by Laz to represent a lawyer who had been charged with allegedly impersonating the liquidator of the Post newspaper, uh, Laz decided to represent that lawyer. The facts of the matter were that the government had commenced liquidation proceedings against the largest independent newspaper in Zambia, the Post newspaper, ostensibly for tax evasion. Mr. Nchicho State Council challenged the appointment of the provisional liquidator of the Post newspaper in the name of the shareholders of the company on the basis of a principle set out in a leading court case. 
which states that directors or shareholders may challenge the appointment of a receiver in the name of a company, in the name of the company. So both Mr. Inchito and the Post newspaper were viewed as enemies of the state. Last defended him because we believe that, the, that his independence as a legal practitioner was being infringed upon in accordance with rule 22 of our legal practitioners rules. In March, 2017, four busloads of ruling party political cadres arrived at the last secretariat and demonstrated outside our offices, calling on me to come out and publicly form my own political party. Some were carrying weapons. Luckily, they didn't manage to enter our offices as the police quickly dispersed them. The demonstration was contrary to the Public Order Act, but no action was taken. And we've seen the Public Order Act used as a weapon against dissenting voices. Thankfully, in that event, uh, the matter was uh, de-escalated through an intervention by the Salak Lawyers Association and the International Commission of Jurists. During my two-year term, there were many periods when I feared for my personal safety. In April 2017, a ruling party member of parliament published a draft bill purportedly to dissolve the Law Association of Zambia and to create multiple law societies in Zambia. Note that at that time, there were only around a thousand lawyers in Zambia and creating multiple societies would have weakened Laza's voice. In May 2017, a group of ruling party affiliated lawyers moved a motion to have the Laz Council impeached at an extraordinary general meeting of the Law Association. They alleged that the law, the law Association was not adhering to its mandate and was too political. The motion was withdrawn at the meeting when it became clear that the, that the tide was not moving in favor of the movers of the motion. So the space for independent views in Zambia is shrinking. After the Post newspaper was shut down, several other media houses have been threatened and attacked civil society is being stifled. The country is polarized along political and tribal lines, which has even divided the church. In April 2017, the leader of the opposition was arrested on treason charges for failing to give way to the presidential motorcade, which heightened political tensions. The case was eventually dismissed several months later. So, there was a feeling by some members of LAS that the Council of the Law Association had brought its troubles on itself by not engaging enough with the government. Whilst this may be true, whilst it may be true that LAS could have engaged more with government, it was also true that there was a reluctance on the part of the government to engage with us. The government took an, an you're either with us or against the stance which made operating as an independent organization very difficult. I think that the events post the general elections, which included a short-lived declaration of a threatened state of emergency and attempts to overhaul the constitution to make it easier for the incumbents to remain in power and the rising legal authoritarianism have vindicated the law association. So what have I learned from my experience? Being the first woman to be elected to the position of president of the Law Association of Zambia, I completely concur with the late great David Bowie, who once said, don't be the first, be the second. Uh, so what is the role of bar associations in promoting the rule of law? I believe that our role is simple, to speak truth to power and hope that sense will prevail. Just as we learned from Jesus Christ, the truth is often seen as a rebellious act and telling it can have disastrous effects to the bearer of the truth. But as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, cowardice asks, is it safe? Expediency asks, is it strategically advantageous? Vanity asks, is it popular? But conscience asks, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor strategically advantageous, nor popular but one must take a position because it is right. Speaking the truth to power can be risky, particularly in countries where democracy is on the retreat. On the 7th of July, 2017, I gave a, a similar address to the Pan-African Lawyers Union. Seated next to me was Tundu Lisu, the president of the Tanganyika Law Society, 
which is the Tanzanian Bar Association. He had his own horror stories to tell. And after our session, we exchanged our respective presentations and joked that this would probably find, we'd probably find ourselves in jail before the end of our terms. Exactly two months later, Mr. Lisu, who was also a member of parliament, was shot 16 times by unknown assailants in the parking lot of his parliamentary residence in Dodoma. Luckily, he survived, but he has since gone into exile following a failed presidential bid. In conclusion, I'm not urging lawyers to be foolhardy. Self-preservation is an important natural instinct. What I am urging is for lawyers not to sacrifice principle for expediency. And I think we all have a role to play in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for such an inspiring presentation. I now move to our final speaker, Mr. Prashant Kumar. Prashant is president of the Bar Association of India, and he was the president of Laurasia from 2015 to 2017. A policy economist turned lawyer, he specializes in constitutional law, commercial and civil matters, arbitration and intellectual property, as well as matters relating to information technology law, infrastructure agreements, public-private partnerships and anti-dumping laws. Mr. Kumar's law firm seconded three domain consultants to the Asia Development Bank um, and led a project team to carry out IT reform in the Delhi judiciary as a pilot project in 2003 to 2005. And he actively engages in assisting infusion of technology in judicial systems on an informal basis. He has taken a keen interest in using technology to carry out legal processes and his firm has developed and worked successfully uh, on IT-based dispute resolution models for resolving mass auto loan disputes in which statements of claim and documentation is generated in a fully automated manner involving a range of legal and fact variations. Arbitrations are also made available um, in this context as far as assisting with programs which produce a template award for arbitrators, which can be validated, improved and utilized as a basis to pass on appropriate awards. Mr. Kumar heads KPA legal, a boutique law firm with a clientele that includes MNCs and major corporate houses in India. Um, Mr. Kumar is a life member of both the Bar Association of India and the Supreme Court Bar Association and he has held various positions in the Bar Association of India and currently serves as its president, as I indicated beforehand. I'll hand it over to Prashant, if I might. Thank you, thank you, Mary. Uh, you know, there are some advantages of being the last speaker because uh, you have the benefit of uh, erudite presentations by very eminent panelists and they have sort of uh, you know, sets out the context and all. So uh, I will try to make my presentation both from uh, my position from Indian Bar, as well as uh, my past position as a Low Asia president to uh, highlight the role which the Bar Associations can play in uh, uh, upholding the rule of law and what challenges they face in the process, both domestically and internationally. Now, uh, David had uh, brought in a very relevant point, though that uh, was more in the context of the pandemic here, that uh, there is a slide uh, in various parameters related to rule of law in the rule of law index 2020. Uh, I happened to join the World Justice Project uh, to have the uh, 2.0 iteration of Rule of Law Index. So I'm on a working group on that and we are working. But you know, more than that, what I wish to highlight and that came uh, from, you know, almost the uh, very uh, courageous li lived experience of Linda as uh, you know, leader of the bar and head in the bar association is uh, the fact that 
world over, and especially, you know, uh, we were looking at stabilizing and expansion of the template of liberal democracy. But uh, in the last decade or the current decade, the trend which has emerged is that uh, uh, the political parties and the strong leaders have found a way uh, to construct majorities which can propel them to power in first past the post elections uh, in a specific manner where the appeal to their constituents is to the exclusion of others. So earlier, this trend was, uh, at least in uh, bigger democracies, not so pronounced that you have uh, the democratic process being played out in a manner which is in its tone exclusionary. And that is where we saw what happened in the last administration in the United States. And that is where you know some of the concerns and uh, issues uh, regarding even uh, Brexit, David, and uh, regarding immigration and all other issues. So, and it is directly in opposition to, uh, you know, we are having this uh, web series in uh, collaboration with Commonwealth Lawyers Association, Law Asia, Law Council, and South Pacific Lawyers Association. And uh, so we are looking at a good number of jurisdictions which have written constitutions, constitutions which are the instruments of uh, limiting power. Uh, the constitutions uh, which are there to uh, limit or control the bias of the majoritarian electoral process, which is bedrock of democracies. Now, here, when these forces have started playing out, and we as lawyers, uh, you know, as in individual capacity or as bar associations are there, to enforce the law and the constitution and the constitutional values. So we find that not just the pandemic here, the way uh, the globally this phenomena is uh, panning out is quite worrisome and it requires the bar associations to step up and to take their uh, role of uh, being vanguards of the rule of law more actively, more seriously, and more courageously, because that has become an imperative right now. And even in the democracies where we thought that uh, these issues are well settled and they have attained a certain degree of maturity, so, but we are watching slowly those notions giving way to crumbling of institutions and uh, you know, coming in place of new power structures. So let me start with the Bar Association of India, uh, which was a voluntary body established uh, and inaugurated on 2nd April of 1960. At that time, uh, India was uh, a democracy which was under the constitutional rule for a decade. 1950, the Constitution of India came into force and it was one of the most liberal documents. And we were fortunate to have uh, uh, the founding fathers and uh, you know, the drafting committee members of the constitution who drafted the constitution of the Bar Association of India. So uh, on the 2nd April itself, when uh, the, uh, India's first attorney general, who was also the Bar Association founding president, uh, you know, if uh, I set out what uh, he said in a small paragraph, and you'll find that it has a distinct uh, echo and relevance uh, even today, after, you know, more than 60 years. So he said, we aim at upholding the Constitution of India, the representative, free and democratic form of government established by it and the promotion of the rule of law. We are to endeavor to apply our knowledge and experience 
in the field of law to the promotion of the public good. The men of the law cannot afford to stand aside when the country is forging ahead along its newly chosen path. There are trends in our body politic which seem to make the authoritarianism and draws toward the rule of a few. Important decision affecting public interest is taken not by governmental agencies, but by the parties in power whose dictates seem in turn to be followed by the governments. There is an unmistakable tendency to belittle the function of the judicial process and indeed to interfere with its operations. Corruption is set to stalk at large and we all know how corruption has in many places led inevitably to the rise of power of autocratic force. It should be the paramount duty of a body composed of men pledged to the smooth and impartial administration of justice and the orderly development of a true democracy to earnestly ponder over these and like situations and take active and energetic measure to counter them insofar as such action may lie within its power. So at the inception itself, basically the role and mandate of the Bar Association was set out and uh, the audience was the first president of the Republic of India, the Prime Minister Nehru, the Vice President and the Chief Justice. So that time, uh, the democracy, though it was evolving, but there was a lot of idealism, which has scattered out by now, has got diluted still. But even at that time, these concerns were there and were clearly and robustly spelled out. So what has been the journey from there? Uh, the journey has been quite productive, but at the same time fraught as well. Fraught in the sense that it is not merely that the governments uh, do not follow the mandate of the constitution, the majoritarian principle, how it works out. It is also that ultimately the uh, separation of powers and role of independent judiciary, which plays a very important role in India. Uh, most of the things which we have in the name of rule of law has been there because of a strong and independent judiciary. And that judiciary cannot be sustained unless until you have a strong and independent legal profession to back that judiciary not just that it is members of the bar who eventually take the judicial positions, it is also because the bar is both the sounding board and comes to the defense when the judiciary faces challenges and stress from the executive and the legislative branch. So, and because it is only the bar which can build the opinion and educate the citizenry that what is happening, which they may not understand as complex processes of governance, how it affects them, how it affects their rights, and what can be the consequences for the citizenry at large. So these foundational uh, functions of the bar associations are very important. And uh, yes, we as lawyers, barristers go and argue the cases. And uh, the second aspect comes when we find that uh, within the judiciary, uh, you know, there are some judges who are more executive minded than the executive itself. So what happens then? Individual lawyers, even the stalwarts of profession, when they go and stand there and point out things, uh, if the same thing is backed by the force of collectivity of the bar association, you can check and correct the judiciary, uh, which is uh, all the judges who are acting to arm, 
And also, uh, you know, when the judiciary is not acting so robust, but there are some members within the bench who are uh, there who can show courage, but they should have sustenance from the bar that if they enforce the rule of law in its true pristine glory and effectiveness and with boldness, then there is a strong bar to back them because the citizens may not even understand what is the impact and value of a judicial pronouncement generally. So that is why the role of the bar associations is very vital and when through various concerns due to economic competitiveness, the new power dynamics in electoral democracies are coming to the fore as uh, now the trends and uh, uh, tendencies. I think our role has become much more important. Uh, it was always, but now we have to step up even further. And the other trend is, and the pandemic has showcased it, it was always there in some form or the other, that the executive branch resents the legal profession to an extent, because we are the ones who, uh, you know, get the administrative action struck down. We are the ones who, uh, you know, if the investigating agencies have uh, not done uh, correct work, we are the ones who appear for the ones who are innocent or whose legal rights have been infringed. So it puts a kind of a check. So uh, in most of the jurisdictions, lawyers are not the most welcome people, which uh, you know the executive branch will entertain or appreciate. We are necessary evils at best uh, for them. So that is where, again, the collectivity of an independent and robust bar association is what matters. And we have seen it uh, in full display in certain law Asia jurisdictions. Uh, in India, we, you know, we had a majority government after a long time. And the first legislative measure through a constitutional amendment, which required not just three fourth majority, but also ratification of majority of the federating states of the union, so the government uh, managed to pass that constitution amendment with near political unanimity, only one vote of a lawyer member of parliament against a new law for uh, judicial appointments, which have been very independent in India. And it is the Bar Association which stepped up, challenged that law, and uh, we fought that law 49 days of continuous hearing during vacation and uh, brought forth one of the most emphatic, uh, you know, exercise of judicial power by striking down an amendment to the constitution, uh, which limited, uh, which was bringing uh, a role, an all outside role of government in picking and choosing judges which would have been catastrophic in uh, you know, a majoritarian uh, democracy, a majoritarian uh, election-based democracy, the government, I would say. And recently now we have been, uh, we, we had to deal with issues. We are uh, now, uh, you know, also the new technology and other things. Now the government wants access to the emails, computers, hard drives, this of the lawyers, and uh, the national security issues and all. So the privilege, lawyer client privilege is becoming a very, very threatened commodity. And uh, because now it is much easier, you don't have to sit through the files, documents cannot be this thing. You just take a smartphone away or this thing, invade a lawyer's office and you can have everything uh, which the lawyer has. And the entire notion is entirely stripped off. And we had to chastise a few of uh, the members of our highest judiciary of making public statements, which showed that uh, they are too appreciative and uh, indeed enamored by the current executive. So these are the issues which are coming here. 
And then, uh, you know, certain bar associations have worked wonderfully well. Uh, Sri Lanka has always stepped up uh, when their chief justice uh, was uh, removed and tried. They sought law issues assistance in sending a mission. Nepal Bar Association asked Law Asia to be observer for the Nepal elections. And uh, uh, then Pakistan uh, Law Asia sent a mission when all the judges during the martial law of uh, uh, General Musharraf uh, were removed. And Law Asia was the only organization through its members like India, Australia, and Malaysia was able to send down a mission as uh, you know the bar members of the bar were struggling there. They were being attacked by uh, the partisans of the government, and we went there during the time. And uh, Linda, I also had uh, the not always but one episode of the experience which you had. Uh, I and my colleagues, uh, uh, Chris Leon and uh, others, were detained in a 12-hour armed facility when we went uh, to Maldives, where they had arrested their chief justice. And it is to enforce the notion of rule of law in the region that we went there knowing very well that the jurisdiction which can arrest their own chief justice may not be kind to us as well. But we had the mandate of all the regional bar associations. We had independent professionals from the region standing behind us. And that is why we could have this courage. We could undertake this action and go there. And lastly, North Korea. Uh, Paul, in Law Asia, especially when I was the president, I, uh, you know, we, even earlier also, we took a view that even if the bar association currently there is under the government and is not an independent sort of bar association as we find, but nevertheless, they are members of a legal profession. And despite all other things, if we don't engage with them, if we refuse to engage with them, should situation change in future in North Korea, who will be the people we will liaise on as a rule of law global community to revive, create, and stabilize the rule of law in that jurisdiction? So I think this uh, value of engaging with other professions, even when they face limitations, rather than saying they don't come to our standards and their regimes are very anti people and don't fit into the liberal democracy template, which we all want to uh, you know, promote and adhere to. Uh, well, we diverged as Law Asia from that view and we engaged with the North Korean bar. So this is uh, pretty much, uh, I think I have run through my time. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Prashant. Um, it seems to me, yes, as we are moving to the panel discussion, that there are three obligations that we've all identified. And they are to defend the rule of law, protect the independence of the judiciary, but also to protect the individual lawyers as well as legal institutions. But what seems to be coming apparent is this fine line that we now face in modern times. Uh, where protection of the rule of law, one needs to also not be party politically. But in some circumstances, it obviously becomes quite difficult from the examples that Linda and Prashant have provided and others. So I want to ask the panel, when one wishes to intervene, and you are all presidents or previous presidents of bar associations or law societies, in that position, how do you traverse it? What, how do you deal with this fine line? And I'll put that question first, I think, to Paul Harris. Any insights, Paul? Are uh, you still on mute? I've been at the center of the, precisely this issue because some people objected to the fact that I was a member of the British Liberal Democrat Party. And, um, 
this arose in a rather acute form in one of the national security cases in which I'm briefed because there was talk about bail conditions for release and uh, one of them was having contact with members of foreign political parties, at which point I resigned my membership so that my client wouldn't actually be prejudiced through having a member of a foreign political party as their lawyer. I felt it was wrong that I had to do so um, because the English bar on which the Hong Kong bar is loosely modeled uh, has had many highly independent minded uh, chairpersons who've been members of different political parties and it's never interfered with their independence or their ability to speak out for the bar in their proper professional role. So I feel that um, it is not right to say that the ch chairman of a bar should have no political affiliation. Uh, I think what matters is that the chair of the bar uh, recognizes they have a particular role as chairman of the bar dealing with legal issues and that uh, party political campaigning is something different. And it's that which I think is not compatible with the role of chairman of the bar. Those are my views. Thank you. Uh, there's a question that's come forward, um, which I'm going to pose to Linda, if I might. It's what role can neighbouring or international bar associations play in offering solidarity to law associations that come under attack? And I think that cohesion of the different institutions or legal institutions that Prashant referred to also comes into play in this particular question. So can I hand it over to you, Linda, to make comment? Uh, thank you, Mary. As I mentioned in my presentation, when, when our association was under attack, uh, we received a lot of support from uh, the Southern African Human Rights, uh, sorry, the SADC Lawyers uh, Association, as well as the International Commission of Jurists. And it was immensely helpful because it diffused the tensions, at least for that period of time. And uh, I think that the Commonwealth Lawyers Association also aims to, to perform the same role uh, when when people are attacked across the Commonwealth, um, we've, we've we've certainly issued statements uh, within the African region, uh, within Asia, uh, all over all about um, rule of law issues. And I think it, it it certainly a lot of governments do respond positively when they when they're shamed publicly. Uh, some do not, which is unfortunate, but the, the vast majority do. And so it's very helpful to have that kind of support and solidarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we've also discussed today the idea of endangered lawyers, individuals who stand up to protect the rule of law or the independence of the judiciary. And we've touched on this idea of a cohesive uh, view when one individual speaks to power as Linda has indicated and Prashant I think has also said we need cohesion I'm going to ask this question of David Green if I might I think you've had some examples at the Law Society of England and Wales in what might be done to aid those who are endangered those lawyers who are facing uh, such critical issues and, and safety issues in speaking up or speaking truth to power There we go. Yeah. Um, can I can I just um, just to pick a pick? A, I, I'm going to answer that question. I think I think first of all is that um, I, I should deal with this political question about um, uh, law associations entering the political arena. Uh, we try as hard as we can not to be party political, uh, not to appear to be party political. We represent members from all, uh, all backgrounds with all views. Uh, and, and I'd give a, a, a domestic example of, of, of Brexit, uh, that, that we represent uh, many lawyers who are either in favour or against. And it's important that we, we, we maintain a, a degree of neutrality. Um, the, 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 the perception can be different um, and um, there, it is a difficult um, line to tread to ensure that, that whatever we say has the rule of law as its, as its foundation, so that we're talking about the rule of law when we intervene. Uh, we've seen uh, recently in this, this jurisdiction um, some attack upon immigration lawyers um, by, by government spokespersons, uh, and we um, condemn that. 
uh, uh, wholeheartedly. Um, and when we do that, we must do it. It's our obligation. And I think actually a government would be surprised, the Ministry of Justice would be surprised if we didn't. So it's, that, that is important. Uh, as far as um, a politics is concerned, as local politics is, I think that the solidarity of lawyers around the world sitting, sitting behind or with us, uh, whether, whether it's this jurisdiction or other jurisdictions, is also important and in Hong Kong we very much support the bar there uh, and um, the Law Society of Hong Kong uh, similarly um, uh, in, in Zambia is standing next to each other and, and, and Linda's talked about um, uh, the power of uh, SADC. Um, as far as um, law, endangered lawyers are concerned we have a, a, an extensive program in relation to, to lawyers uh, and we undertake um, many activities. Uh, we've been very active in Colombia um, uh, supporting those who face death threats on a daily basis for simply doing their job and for simply representing clients uh, uh, against the state. Uh, we have supported um, our colleagues in Turkey. Uh, we have recently seen um, a Turkish lawyer um, die on a hunger strike, Ebru Timtik, uh, and um, we um, uh, support um, the uh, other lawyer there um, uh, similarly, and indeed we've been written, just written to the Turkish government in relation to uh, the conditions in which he uh, is kept. Uh, and I think that when we, when we talk to lawyers for whom we supported, um, a letter to the Turkish government, does, does it make a difference? Well, it often, makes a di it often makes a difference to have someone outside saying, no, that's not right. Um, secondly, is it makes a difference to the individual that they know they've got the support around the world of fellow lawyers. And I think that, that we treasure um, the work we do uh, on behalf of those lawyers around the world, uh, and we think it um, absolutely vital. Um, I, I just um, touch on this as a final point is, um, the crust of democracy can be thin, uh, but it can be resilient. And, and I think it was Paul who mentioned Malawi, uh, for instance. And of course, we did see a, a strong uh, a court uh, in uh, Malawi overturning uh, a, a recent election. Uh, and that was very much a, a mark of the independence of the judi judiciary. Uh, but it is, it can be attacked, that democracy, and the rule of law is absolutely essential to a, a working democracy. And we have to be as law societies, as, as bars, very, very careful, very, very watchful, uh, and um, uh, strident uh, in, in ensuring that we maintain our support um, for the rule of law. I think it's an essential part of the work we do. Thank you. Uh, the next question I'm going to pose is to uh, Jacoba Brush. Um, it's slightly taking a different tack. Um, we've talked about the independence of the judiciary and trust and confidence in the judiciary is so very important. And now we have um, a situation where there are many tensions in relation to how society might deal with the judiciary. We've heard the example uh, that Prashant had indicated um, in respect of the Chief Justice in um, Sri Lanka, I think. So the question is, how does a more diverse bench contribute to the rule of law? Can it or, or not as a reflective uh, diversity of society? Does it build more trust and confidence? What what uh, are your insights on this? Um, we all come from, you know, linguistically, culturally, geographically, um, culturally diverse countries, all of us on, on this. And there's a difficulty, though, if a bench, if a judiciary all looks and sounds the one way, they all look, um, Mary, we, you know, surprises in Australia have had a long tradition, which is now broken down of um, mature aged Caucasian men to the bench. Now that, that's not representing Australia. So diversity on the bench, we've long adv advocated for, um, first of all, a transparent process of appointments, um, but also for all cultures, all ethnicities, all genders, um, sexual persuasions. It's everybody should be able to identify with the person that looks like them on the bench because then there's a confidence thing, there's a trust thing. 
Um, that's not to say anything bad about the, the um, homogenous, you know, if they all look the same, but it's a confidence building thing. And also when you have somebody from a different background or a different gender, a different um, ethnicity, culture, whatever the case might be, there are other perspectives that can be brought to the judicial decision-making process. So to me, um, a multicultural, multilinguistic, a truly representative or diverse bench um, assists in the community looking and going, yeah, yeah, the, it, it looks, it has a makeup that looks like, like, um, like me, if you will. Thank you. We only have a minute or so. So what I'm going to go is to each of the panelists and say one word, one very quick message, in no longer than a phrase. If I go to you and say, how do we as lawyers confront these challenges we discussed today? What is that one thing, that one aspect that you can put forward? So I'm just going to go through our panelists very quickly. Prashant, for you, what would that be? Uh, you were on mute, so. Yeah, I think the bar has to stand for the independence of judiciary, which is most important, and for robust institutions remaining robust. Any if bar becomes diluted in its sense, it will have impact on the judiciary. So an independent, a robust and courageous bar is what is required. Without that rule of law and democracy, will be very difficult to sustain. Thank you. Linda. Um, I think I would echo what uh, Prashant is saying. Definitely without an independent bar and an independent judiciary, the rule of law will decline, democracy will decline. And so it's absolutely crucial that uh, the law asso associations play their role in defending both the rule of law and human rights in any country by maintaining their independence and impartiality. Thank you. Jacoba. Thanks, Mary. Um, a voice, a voice that is um, bathed in courage, integrity, respect, and good judgment. Thank you. David. Uh, my phrase for you is uh, strength in solidarity to support the rule of law. Uh, and, and that, I think, is um, uh, absolutely vital for law associations and bars. Thank you. Paul, finally. I agree with uh, the other panellists, and I would add the word resilience. Do not give up. <laughs> Thank you so very much. We're now at the end of this session, and I think that what we've all been saying is bar associations have a critical societal duty in upholding the rule of law. We have explored some of these aspects this evening and some aspects of the duty, but it's a large and difficult topic to navigate in modern times with these modern challenges that have been described by our panelists. We have taken a step forward at least this evening, so let us continue that conversation. I want to sincerely thank our eminent panelists and also to all of those who attended from such vast corners of the world. Thank you for your participation and I'll close the session for this evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for so ably chairing the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.